there is a mission briefing and we didn't really have enough footage to fill that scene. Um, Stephen Mirioni, he came up with a way of intercutting that mission briefing with shots of Maverick and the other pilots on the deck inspecting their planes. That was a brilliant way of intercutting those scenes and those images and finding a great piece of music to run under that to create a visual tone poem for that moment in the movie before we get into the mission. Hi, and welcome back to Studio Binder Academy. I'm Brandon. Today, we're speaking with editor Eddie Hamilton, whose previous work includes Kingsman, Top Gun Maverick, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, and many more. Eddie, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me, Brandon. It's great to talk to you. Happy to be here, sir. Oh, we're, we're so happy to have you here. Your body of work is phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of embarrassing entries on IMDb as well. Uh, you know, early in your career, ev- everyone has them. But I'm really grateful that in the last few years, things have been going well in my career. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes, yes. I, I know you're, you're working on the new Mission Impossible. Is that correct? Yes, we've got about a year and a half till it comes out. So we'll be working flat out on that uh, to make it as good as we can for audiences around the world next year. Excellent. Well, I know for myself and everybody at the Studio Binder team, we're very excited to see it. Thank you. Thank you. So to start off with, we want to get your filmmaking story. You know, were there any specific movies and or filmmakers that inspired you to become a filmmaker? Yeah, it's very simple, actually. So when I was eight years old, I remember I I actually I wasn't taken to the movies much as a kid, but I remember I did watch a lot of movies on television when we had three TV channels in the UK, a little bit like in the US when it got started. Um, Mm -hmm. And Star Wars was on TV in 1980 on a commercial station called ITV. And my dad had a Betamax video recorder. And I remember he recorded the movie and the movie started at 8 p.m. And obviously it was like two and a half hours with commercials. But my bedtime, being eight years old, was 9 p.m. So I missed the second (laughs) half of the movie. And the next day I got up at 4 a.m. I was so excited by what I'd seen. It was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen in my life, right? Um, I was was so excited by it that I I went downstairs at 4 a.m. and I put the Betamax tape in and I turned the volume on the TV down very low. And I watched the second half of Star Wars, like glued to the screen like this. And it was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. And I, I was so speechless and my, my whole body was tingling with excitement at the end of it. And then I remember seeing people's names coming up at the end of the movie, you know, written and directed by George Lucas, produced by Gary Kurt. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, wait, those are people's names. So maybe like people make films. They don't just turn up on TV like human beings actually do this. Because my parents didn't really, you know, weren't really into movies that much. You know, my mum was a teacher. My dad was a businessman. Um, He ran an office furniture company. But from the age of eight, from that moment at like 5.30 or 6 a.m. when I finished Star Wars and I quickly turned off the TV and ran back upstairs to my bedroom to pretend that (laughs) I was still in bed. Um, From that moment, I was obsessed with films. And I read every book that I could on it. And I listened to music any soundtrack I could listen to, anything that came on TV about behind the scenes on movies. I would record movies, beg my friends, parents to take me to the cinema to see movies. And uh, so all through the 80s, I was just fed a, a, you know, I took myself to the cinema constantly. And, 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 and that was really the, the, the start of my love story with, with movies. And I thought I'd be a writer or a director because everyone just knew George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. And and now mm-hmm. it's like, you know, James Cameron's up there, Peter Jackson, you know, those kind of legendary filmmakers, Chris Nolan for the kind of modern kids in the world. They are all obsessed with Chris Nolan, rightly so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and so that's who you think you're going to be. And when I was 17, I played around with hooking up two VHS decks together. You'll have to look that up if you don't know what that is. <laughs> But but oh, um, yeah. I basically, I would I would I would I would take my favorite movies and my favorite soundtracks and edit like little montages together by hooking up two VHS machines and pressing play and record. And hours would fly by in the creative process, and I discovered that the combination of storytelling and technology really appealed to me. 
and um uh and so i decided to kind of just learn more about editing and then when i understood a bit more about editing and understood that how much power the editor has in the storytelling process mm-hmm. I became really interested in trying to pursue it as a career. And um, and so I, 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 there weren't really any undergraduate film schools to speak of in the UK in like 1990 when I went to university. So I did a psychology degree at University College London, but I spent like eight hours a day doing student film and TV and four hours a day doing my degree. So I did... I probably spent 12 hours a day doing student film and TV. I did the absolute minimum to get a degree (laughs) um, in psychology, but I did. And I I just spent all my spare time with friends making little 16 millimeter films and shooting videos. And, and, um, and then I applied to film school after university, but I didn't get in. And I always got down to like the last seven or the last five. And then there would be like three places to study editing. There was the National Film and Television School, the Northern School of Film and Television, the Royal College of Arts. There's only really three or four universities, really, postgraduate courses that were that were really good. Didn't get into any of them. So I thought, but I was very young when I applied. That's the thing. Like most of the people applying were like 26 or 28. And I was say 20. 22 so I was much younger had much less life experience and I can understand why um you know the the and looking back on it I can understand that I I probably was very green and I needed to live a little to have something to to you know say or to have some emotional depth to to put into the movies that I was working on you know some some perspective on life you know and um so I got a job. I, I basically got a job as a runner in a post-production facility in central London and and taught myself how to use every piece of equipment in that facility, including very early avid media composers. So this was about, this was about 19, I think 94, 95. Yeah. And the, the, the early avid media composers were coming out. So, um, it was the the early days of kind of digital nonlinear editing. And because I'm quite a nerd, um, I, I thought I'm going to have a play around with this and learn how to do it. And then the facility that I was working at got an online uh, avid media composer. So it could do, you know, compressed but broadcast quality video. And so I, and then I ended up basically editing a lot of sports television programs so I spent maybe a year doing Portuguese and Spanish sports television news programs, um, which is what, what they happen to do at this facility, you know, and I don't speak Portuguese or Spanish and I don't really like sport that much. So, but it did, uh, it did teach me a lot about working incredibly fast on, on the Avid Media Composer software. And then, but I was, I was, I was absolutely focused on trying to work in the film industry somehow. And I got a job as an editor on a very low budget movie. And then I did another few couple of low budget movies. I used to pay the bills by editing videos for the Paramount Comedy Channel, like three days a week. And then the other four days a week, I would work for free on short films and little low budget features and stuff. So that's kind of how I paid the bills. If you're a nice person to work with and you're enthusiastic and you're creative, then kind of word gets around and people would recommend me to other people. And because I was very young and very cheap, you know, and there's a lot of filmmakers out there who, who don't have a lot of money. And so I was able to say, look, you don't have to pay me much. I'll sleep on the floor. I don't care. I just really want to work on your film. And so I, I kind of learned by doing really uh, for years. And the biggest break then was about maybe six years later in 2001, I met Matthew Vaughan, who is a very prolific obviously director and producer now he, he now he's done kingsman and you know he did x men first class kick ass but back then he was producing and he had produced lock stock and two smoking barrels and snatch with guy ritchie and he was producing a movie called mean machine um which had vinnie jones playing football in prison well not a huge budget but it was uh, it was made to be bought by um columbia pictures uh and so it was kind of like it was a low budget movie but it was 
it was going to be sold to a kind of Hollywood studio in a way for, for release mostly in the UK. But that was kind of my first way in. And then I ended up working with Matthew on Kick-Ass, uh, on X-Men First Class and on Kingsman. So that was my kind of way into slightly larger world of storytelling. And, and X-Men First Class was that was 2010 to 2011. That had a huge budget, obviously, because it was a 20th Century Fox movie. And Lee Smith was the lead editor on that film. Now, Lee Smith had just done Inception, right? Masterpiece and The Dark Knight, Masterpiece. And he was about to do The Dark Knight Rises. But Matthew said, Lee, would you mind if this younger editor, Eddie, gets to co-edit the film with you? And Lee, being very uh, generous, um, said, yes, sure, no problem. And so I, I worked with him and learned a lot about working on these larger studio movies with Lee. So I owe him enormous gratitude, you know, and I, I still catch up with him whenever he's in London and we, we have lunch or have dinner or something. But he was so gracious because he allowed me into his cutting room so I could see how he worked with the footage and how he communicated with visual effects and, and with the studio and, and with the director. And, you know, so I, I, that was an incredible experience. And then when we were finishing Kingsman, the first Kingsman, the secret service, when we were sound mixing, I got a call from my agent about going to meet uh, Chris McQuarrie because he was doing Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. And I thought, well, they're never going to give me that job because I, um, I've never done a, a movie on my own. But I'm going to be very enthusiastic. And I, I love these movies, by the way. I've seen all the Mission movies on opening weekend. I can tell you where I was sitting and which cinema in the world, you know, when I saw them because – you know, that, that's how obsessed with movies I am, how much I love movies. And so Chris McQuarrie and I had a long chat. And then uh, when I was driving away from the interview, I got a call from the post supervisor and he said, hey, can you start on Monday? And I was like, wow, are you really offering me this job? He said, yeah, Chris, really like you. And so that was the beginning of my, um, you know, my entry into very large budget movies as a solo editor. And then, obviously, I did um, – after that, I did Kingsman Golden Circle. Then I did uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Then I did Top Gun Maverick, you know, which was a life-changing experience in many ways. And then came and did Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. So that's the story. But I will say it was 20 years from when I first touched, a, a, you know, an editing computer, an avid media composer, until I got a call to do Mission Impossible. So – it, it was a very long, slow, steady rise up through the industry, you know, and it, it wasn't overnight. Um, and I'm 51 now. So that gives you an idea of, you know, of, of my journey. It's so amazing. I, I've said this before in interviews. This is my favorite part of the interview because everyone's story is so different. And, um, you know, seeing, seeing you persevere and, you know, last it out and to get to where you are now. I think it's so important for people to hear uh, because, you know, we all come up to roadblocks within our own careers. You know, Hollywood's going to tell you no a lot of times, uh, but you're just waiting for that one yes, and that's all it takes. Preparation meets opportunity. You know, so so when I had, I had worked as hard as I could to get my skills up, and then when I got an opportunity to work with Matthew Vaughan, he said to me, okay, um, uh, we're hiring two editors for this movie because they're going to do half the movie each because we haven't got much time. So cut. And, and this was after they'd started filming. So they already had quite a lot of footage mm. in the can. And, and he said, just do as much of the movie as you can in two weeks. And then I'll watch it. And I'll let you know if I'm keeping you on. And so I did, I just, I just worked my ass off for two weeks and got through about 40 minutes of the film. And, and then he liked it. And, and it was literally, I'd been working so hard for that tiny opportunity and never giving up. You know, there were times where I was, there are times when I was very um, dispirited and, and I had no clue how somebody growing up in a small town in the South of England would ever find themselves working in Hollywood. But I never lost the enthusiasm and the passion and I constantly educated myself. And I, I, I loved movies so much. There was no other option. You know, it, there was no plan B. Plan plan B was keep going. 
You know, plan A was succeed. <laughs> yes. Plan B was keep knocking on doors until plan A happened. You know, and and it's interesting when you when I meet young people who want to be editors, sometimes I can see that glimmer or that spark of passion, which will keep them going when things aren't, aren't working out. And it literally is last man standing in this industry. You know, you will succeed because everyone else is given up because it's too hard. You know, to be honest, that, that's the way it is sometimes. And, and you have to make a lot of sacrifices early in your career. You know, when, when you don't have family commitments and you have very low overheads and you're sharing an apartment with other people to, you know, keep the rent low and keep the bills low and stuff. That's when you really need to be digging in and working as hard as you possibly can. And I'm, I would regularly start at 8 a.m. and finish at midnight. Those, those are my shifts when I was in the early days when I would be working for like eight or nine hours and then I would stay behind and work on my own projects or do other things to show people what I could do in the evening. Sometimes I would take a week off. And I would ask to borrow one of the edit suites at work and I would use my week off editing my own stuff, <laughs> but having access to the equipment. Because back then you couldn't edit on your phone. Back then you had to have quite a powerful computer to do it. And so I, I, would, I would just ask my manager, can I, can I sit quietly in that edit suite if it's not being used and work on my own videos? And he would say, sure, no problem. Now getting into the role of an editor. I'm sure this might change from editor to editor, but what do you feel the role of an editor is? If there are people out there listening who have no clue what an editor does, I'll, I'll contextualize it a little bit, right? Which is on a big movie, you may have up to 500 people working to make the magic between action and cut happen, right? That film gets exposed. Hundreds of people have been working on it to create the image. Actors, cinematographers, uh, production designers, hair and makeup, special effects, directors, right? You know, everybody. And all that work from hundreds of people goes down to one person who's the editor of the movie. So it's an enormous position of privilege and power. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And my job is to watch all the footage and read the script and work closely with the director of the film to make whatever the best story that exists within the footage is, you know? It doesn't really matter what was on the page and it, it doesn't matter what the director thought they shot on set. What matters is what we actually have in terms of raw footage to make the film. And sometimes that is not exactly what is in the script. And sometimes there are things that have happened on the set which strengthen certain elements of the script or weaken certain elements. And you need to make sure that the very best, the strongest footage is in the film and you minimize the weaknesses. And that process starts uh, by putting together a very rough version of the movie, usually as the production is, is rolling cameras. So on day one, you may be um, setting up your edit suite, but on day two, you're editing footage from day one straight away. And on a big movie, one of the most important things that you're doing immediately is skimming through all the footage and checking for anything, any red flags, basic stuff like stuff's out of focus or the sound isn't great or... Um, or, but then, like, do I, do I have all the coverage that we need to tell the story that's in the script? Are we missing any shots? Um, then you watch. So I normally what happens is I'll skim through all the footage from the day before in like five minutes. I'll just have it all on a timeline and I'll skim down. Sometimes it can be four hours. Sometimes it's two hours. Sometimes it's 40 minutes. Sometimes it's six hours that they've shot the day before. So it's a lot. And you're just scrolling down and you're looking at it all and you're going, okay, I've got a close up here. I've got a wide, I've got a moving camera. I've got an over, I've got an establishing shot. Uh, I see we've got coverage on these two characters. I've got an insert of this. Okay, I see. Right, do we have an insert on the key? I don't see a shot of a key. Right, this key is important. We're going to and I'll, I'll, then I'll send the director a little text message and I'll go, just, just a little reminder about the key. We may need an angle on the key. And the director will go, don't worry, we've already shot that this morning. I'm, or, or, okay, yes, you're right. Sometimes the director will say, why don't you come on to set and set up the shot and show me what you imagine we need uh, and then I'll come over and, and, and we'll roll cameras on it together because the editor is the one who knows exactly what we need for the story. 
And the director may not be as familiar with the footage because then what you do is you watch through it all, you know, from the first frame to the last frame. And what I do is I start to break the all the raw footage down into useful pieces of story so that um, I can find stuff quickly because that's what's really important. If you've got six hours of footage, you need to kind of break it down into useful pieces of story. So if it's an action sequence, I'll break each beat of the action down into all the different coverage that exists for that maybe 10 seconds of action. If it's a dialogue scene, I'll break the footage down by each line of dialogue so I can find different line readings quickly, all that kind of stuff. But the most important thing then is that you throw a version of the scene together. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Like anything, a first draft is usually pretty average, um, but that's the process. That's any creative process. You've just got to get something down on the timeline. doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Just get to the end. Then the fun starts because then you start refining it and then you start improving it. Um. Uh, and then the editor's job after that is to communicate with the director um, about what's working, um, um, what what needs improvement. And then if the director comes to the edit suite, work closely with them on refining the scenes, communicate with the visual effects department. That's so important on these big movies because they rely a lot on visual effects and clear, unambiguous communication between editorial and visual effects is is absolutely critical talking to the producers about, you know, reassuring them that they have what they need. Um, maybe talking to the composer, if there's a composer on board, working with the sound effects team, starting to communicate and making sure there's a very good creative discussion going on. Um, on a big movie as well, the editor is in charge of managing the team uh, of assistant editors. So it's very important that I hire really great assistant editors who will work well together and who understand um, the demands of the job and the confidentiality of the job uh, and the technical perfection of the job. Um, that's very important. And then ultimately you, you build the entire movie on a timeline and then you refine it and 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 refine it for weeks and weeks and weeks and then months and months and months and, you know, two years on Top Gun Maverick or, it, to be honest, on Mission Impossible, it was nearly three years of editing, but wow. that's because we were also shooting bits of the second movie. So, mm. so it wasn't strictly three years, but I started in August 2020 and the movie came out in July 2023. So that gives you an wow. idea of how long it takes. And I, I, we, no detail is too insignificant. I, I literally am mm. thinking about holding the audience's hand emotionally from the very beginning of the opening credits what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What, what am I doing emotionally? What are we doing emotionally with the music, with the visuals? When you make a cut, what is the emotional effect of that cut? What, what, where am I taking the audience? Where were they before? Where, where, where are they now? Whose point of view am I in? Who's my protagonist in the film? Who am I following emotionally? Um, how am I going to make sure that everything that's emotional in a scene is landing for the audience so they follow the story? How am I going to affect their emotion by cutting here to this reaction or cutting earlier or cutting to a wide shot or cutting to a close up? How am I going to affect their emotion by using music or sound design? And that, and then, and then eventually on a long film like Mission Impossible, you're then going, right, I have to do the very most amount of storytelling with the, with the least amount of screen time. So then you're going through every shot in the movie going, is this the right length? Can it be one frame shorter? Can it be two frames shorter? Can I remove this shot? Can I remove this line of dialogue? Can I compress this? Can I make the storytelling simpler? Can I make it stronger? So those are all the things that you do. And you go through the scenes dozens of times in a day. You go over the same scene over and over again. You're looking at going, can this be better? 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 The hours can be very long. You know, My work-life balance is a lot better than it was, but for example, in 2023, because we were rushing to get our release date for mission, I, I probably had six days off between January and July, which is pretty intense. A lot of seven day weeks in there, you know, but mm. we want the movie to be the best it can be. We're absolutely committed to that world class excellence, led, of course, by Tom Cruise, who, who is a living, breathing example of world class excellence in everything that he does. And Chris McCrory, you know, one of the, 
greatest writers uh, and and a phenomenal director and also a great editor you know understands understands the power of editing and works closely with me all the way through the process refining the movie endlessly can it be better can it be better can it be better can it be better you know not leaving any detail to chance everything is considered every tiny little moment Every emotional nuance is considered and poured over. Can it be better? Can it be better? Can it be better? Can it be better? And and that's the process, you know. And and it will start on lower budget movies, and then you work up to a much greater scale. But um, when producers come in and they know that you're that committed to excellence, and you you stay enthusiastic, you know. I've seen the last Mission Impossible film seven hundred times. Same with Top Gun. But I I always maintain enthusiasm and passion for it even though i'm watching it again sometimes you're watching the whole movie three times in a single day because that's the process that you're in if you're if you're approving sound mixes or or um you know color correction or something but you you remain enthusiastic and committed and remembering always remembering that you're working for the audience who are sitting there in the movie theater wanting a great night at the movies and you've got to deliver it you've got to deliver it as best you can you know, you have to make your, you, you, you'll regret it if it's not as good as it can possibly be. Every frame of the movie has to be as good as it can possibly be. And every, everything you hear, like every line of dialogue, every sound effect, every note of music, we go over, it takes weeks to mix the sound on these movies because we're, we're obsessed with like, can it be better? Can it be better? Can it be better? Can it be more emotional? Can I, can it be more immersive? Can it be more emotional? Can it be more immersive? Can I, can I get drawn in more? Can it be tighter? You know, and you're constantly refining, 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 constantly re-editing. I, ideas come up at the 11th hour. You're always incorporating whatever the best idea is to make it better. That, that is probably the most thorough answer I've ever heard on what the role of an editor is. And, but it, it, it makes sense, you know, that culmination of all that work that's going on during production is falling on your shoulders. And I, I, I could, one, see how much pressure that could be, uh, but I can also see how gratifying and satisfying creatively that would be once you get that finished and you see the final product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, not all movies turn out great, but no one wants, no one sets out to make a bad film. That's the thing you have to remember. Everyone <laughs> thinks they're going to make a great film, but there's many reasons why um, films don't work. And, and I've worked on many films that haven't worked for, for one reason or another. It doesn't mean you don't work any less hard on them. You still want them to be as good as they can be. But when, when you start, you know, the more experienced the crew is, the writer, the director, the, you know, the, the cast, I mean, every, you know, when you're working on Mission Impossible, you're working on, you know, with world-class people at every level, at every department. And so it's an enormous privilege. Um, and there's a lot less that can go wrong because people are real experts at what they do. You know, and the other thing is we test the movie so we will show the movie to audiences and many times, actually, and we listen very carefully to what the audience tells us about what is working and what can be improved. And we don't rest until they tell us that it's awesome. And sometimes that might mean uh, radical re-editing. Sometimes that might mean filming for a few more days, you know, to clarify something in the story or to, if we're cutting something out of a film, to replace it with something else that makes more sense for the audience emotionally. Um, but you know, they never, the uh, film studios know that if you spend a little bit more resources to improve the film, it will net in a lot more love at the box office and possibly a classic film that is watched for generations to come, you know, which is the Holy grail when you're making a movie, if your film stands that kind of test of time, you know, which is enormously gratifying. Absolutely. I, I, I would imagine that, you know, I haven't been to that level, but, you know, I've worked on my own projects, seen, you know, gone to film festivals and you see you see your work up there and it, it's it, it's a, you know, it's a fulfilling thing. Um, and I could imagine on, on something that of that scale, it would be phenomenal. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's wonderful. The amount of love that Top Gun Maverick got, especially after the pandemic, 
was astonishing to me and was enormously satisfying. It was a very, very, very hard film to work on. I mean, I've never worked harder in my life. Um, but the movie came out really well and everyone loved it. Uh, and, you know, it, it was it was astonishing to have that happen because, you know, you can work your whole career and that never happens. And so to be kind of in the eye of the storm when that was happening around the world was just just unbelievable you know, to have played a part in, in making a film, which so many people were expressing so much joy for, you know, and and the other thing I loved about Top Gun, which sometimes, you know, I thought about was a lot of kids, it might've been their first trip to the movies ever because movie theaters had been shut for years, you know, two years. So there's some five or six year olds who maybe have never been to a cinema and the first movie that they're going to watch is Top Gun Maverick. Uh, And to have that big screen experience with the sound and the emotion and the music and the excitement, to have that be the catalyst for another young filmmaker, you know, the way it was when, when I saw Star Wars, you know, when I was eight, that that's just enormously gratifying that, you know, there's some kids out there maybe who saw Top Gun Maverick in the theater and we're just so blown away by that out of body experience that you get when you watch an amazing movie where you just can't believe you love it so much. You never want it to end. And it's just the most wonderful thing. You just can't take your eyes off the screen. You're so emotionally invested in it. Um, and so that, yeah, that was just great that maybe there's some kids out there who might, you know, be Christopher Nolan's in 20 years or 30 years, you know, who watch, who watch Top Gun. It's very cool. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's all we can hope for is to inspire that next generation. Now, going into the collaborative process, when working with a director, you had mentioned, you know, Chris McQuarrie having a background in editing. Do you find that's an ideal working relationship with a director or what what would you say your ideal relationship with a a director would be? I really like it um, if the director is or enjoy sitting, working with the editor in a room, just the two of you, um, mm-hmm. for as long as it takes to make a great film. And and emotions, r- there's a roller coaster, let's be honest, because some days you'll come in and you'll go, this is a great scene, and other days you'll come in and you'll go, this scene really isn't working, what are we going to do to fix it? Um, that That's my ideal situation. Now, there are some directors who prefer to leave the editor to cut the film and then see what they do. And I'm happy to do that. But I, I, I really like working closely with the director to make sure that I've got inside that person's head and that I'm delivering what they want out of the movie, you know, especially if they're a writer director, because they're really invested and they understand the emotional nuance from beginning to end because they've written it all. Also, they understand the impact of adjusting the story in terms of if you change this here, you know, the ripple effect later on. So for me, that's the best way. Um, if you're, if you're happy to sit in a room with a director and work with them, it's great fun and it's enormously rewarding and you're kind of discovering the film together and, and, and bouncing ideas off each other because editing is a very solitary process during production. You're just on your own in a room working with the material, slowly putting something on the timeline. And I promise you, Top Gun Maverick was unbelievably time consuming. There was so much footage to go through. And I'm, I never want to take any shortcuts. I'm always super thorough because I, I want to be able to stand my, by my creative choices and present the producer or the director or whoever with multiple options for each emotional moment in the scene which shows that I've been thorough with going through all the material, you know? Um, so, so I like it. And then, and then a director also who understands the power of editing and understands the necessity of editing. So like I said before, it's about saying the most with the least, you know, which means cutting stuff out if it's unnecessary. And, and I never cut stuff out without the director seeing it first so it's important to give stuff, we call it like giving it a day in court. So you, you, you do the best version of the scene and you watch it in the run of the movie. But um, 
the film takes on a life of its own and it kind of tells you what it wants. So as you watch the movie, the movie will, will accept certain ideas and it will reject certain ideas because it will go, I don't need this. The, the rest of the story works. This is extraneous. And so you'll find that you can simplify things. You know, there's a scene in Top Gun Maverick, for example, where Maverick and Penny are on the beach after he's told her that he's going away on the mission and he's in his dress whites. So he looks very smart and they're on the beach. And initially that scene had dialogue. They had like three or four lines of dialogue between them. And um, in the end, we removed all the dialogue because it wasn't necessary. It was way more powerful just to let the music do its thing and to have the characters look at each other and then hug each other. And uh, that's the kind of discovery that you make in editing because it's quite hard to write that insightful emotion on the page which is why sometimes you write dialogue so the actors have something to do um but you quite often find you don't need the dialogue because their the, the behavior and the nuances in their in their face tell you everything you need to know and there are some directors out there who will shoot all the coverage for a scene and then on the last take they will ask the actor to do the whole scene just by thinking the dialogue, not actually speaking the lines, just thinking the lines. And then you have this treasure trove of great reaction shots and behavior, which might be more appropriate emotionally. And so those are the kind of things that you discover when you're editing, especially when you're working alongside a director and bouncing ideas off, off them. Absolutely. Now, speaking of working with assistant director, um, I'm sorry, assistant editors. Yeah. What was what does your typical general uh, working relationship look like, and what are their main responsibilities? Well, okay. So my assistant editors uh, are essential because I'm nothing without them. Um, the first thing they do on a daily basis is they will import all the footage that's been filmed the day before, the picture and the sound. They will sync it all up or check that the sound is in sync. They will group it up if it's multiple cameras. Um, they'll start marking up all the resets so that I can see when the director goes back to one in the middle of a take. Um, they will start r typing notes into the, um, you know, into the metadata in the scene bin so I can see what the script supervisor wrote. There's a lot of things that they do to prepare the footage for me to make sure that you know, I can do my work of editing the movie. There is so much technically that has to be perfect because if you make a mistake right at the beginning, that state will ripple down through the whole of post-production and will magnify and get bigger and bigger. And so it's very important that, that you have experienced assistant editors who will not allow mistakes to get through. And, um, uh, and so I have, and they're also in charge of media management, which means um, making sure that the, the files are organized correctly on all the hard drives that we have. We always have three backups of everything. I have a hard drive that I carry around to set with me with all the footage. There's a networked hard drive, you know, an Avid Nexus that we all work on. Then there are two individual other backups that we have um, so that we have, you know, four copies of everything at any one time. Um, so it's their job to maintain those backups and then to do other things. You know, our trainee will do things like, you know, getting lunch for people and organizing birthday cakes and things like that um, for the for the team. Um, they all understand how confidential the work is. They all understand that, you know, timekeeping is very important. Like I, I if they tell me that they'll be ready to give me a piece of work at this time. I expect it to be ready at that time because I will have planned my day around that. So checking their work to make sure it's perfect because it has to be. Our entire reputation in editorial rests on accurate information coming in to, ed to the edit and accurate information going out to the other departments. Um, so my team understand that. But then we also want to have a good work-life balance and we want to have fun. Um, but if uh, we are under the under a tight deadline, we also need to know that everyone is prepared to stay a bit later to get things over the finish line if we need them done, and um, and that we're all just nice people who will support each other and um, who have pride in our work 
uh, and um, love movies, you know, really love movies. That's so important because everyone is an essential part of, of the process of making this kind of end result, which is hopefully going to be watched by millions of people around the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So from what I hear, it sounds like organizational skills, attention to detail, persistence. Is there any other qualities that you would say an editor or an assistant editor might have that would lend to them being ineffective at their job? Yeah. A few other things like bullet points, which I, which I do mention to them. Our reputation is built on accuracy, not speed. So it's very important to be accurate and more haste. You know, don't be fast. You know, if, if, if you mm. need more time to check your work, so never assume anything. Always check. Like never, never go, um, oh, I exported that file with sound, so it will have sound. You know, check that it has sound on it because there's nothing more embarrassing than sending a file to a director and there's no sound on it. I, I want someone to have checked it all. Um, another sad fact of life for every human being in any job is that one mistake will be remembered much longer than a thousand things you get right. So uh, try to avoid making mistakes by checking your work. And it's just a fact, sadly, and you'll beat yourself up about it. You know, if you, I, I um, and also put your hand up if you make a mistake, like own up to it immediately because you can usually fix it. There was one movie where an assistant accidentally deleted one single file off, off our um, network storage and didn't tell anybody. And then things started to go wrong around three o'clock in the afternoon and spiral out of control. And the assistant had been trying to fix it, but was unable to because they were quite inexperienced. They were junior. And then I, I came in and I said, what's going on with the machine? And, and the assistant eventually put up their hand and said, look, I, I, I should have said this at nine o'clock this morning, but I accidentally deleted a file. I'm really sorry. I said, look, you have to own up, all right? We're all human. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. You have to own up. And we have a backup right there. And I could have copied the file back on in 20 seconds, and it would have fixed it. And you, But you didn't own up, and that was the problem. If you'd owned up, it would have been fine because I would have gone, don't worry, we've all done that. I did that when I was your age. You'll learn never to do it again, and we can fix it right now. But you didn't own up. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I am really detail oriented with, you know, how to organize the footage because you really have to. When you've got 800 hours of footage on Top Gun, I need to find stuff quickly. You can't just have it all just sitting there in a, in a pile. You know, you need to have it broken down meticulously so that you can find every single line of dialogue that any actor said. You know, and I'm really pernickety with how how things are labeled. You know, I don't like stuff in all caps and I like double spaces sometimes and certain punctuation and stuff. And um, I like my team to have a life. So I want my team to be able to go to the doctor or to watch their kids' school play or to whatever it is that they need to do. When you work on a movie where you have, you know, there's 10 of us, if, including me. So it's me, two first assistant editors, two second assistant editors, a trainee, visual effects editor, visual effects assistant editor, music editor, and post-production supervisor. So there's 10 of us. And a lot of people can do each other's jobs. So I say, if you need to go to do something in your life, just tell me and go, right? Because I, I don't want you to feel like you're going to miss out on anything. That's so important, really. And it wasn't always the way, but it is so important. And then gratitude is, is essential. Like, I try and tell my team every day that I'm very grateful for their hard work because I'm nothing without them. And it costs nothing to say thank you to people. And it has the greatest impact on morale and on uh, your appreciation for your team, you know? Um, and then confidentiality, which goes without saying, but if, if any single image of anything that's, you know, if anyone takes a selfie inside inside the editing room, if they post it on social media, that's a major black mark. You know, nothing can come out, nothing can leak. And if anything is, if any leak from the movie is traced back to editorial, unfortunately that person has to be let go immediately. And everyone signs a non-disclosure agreement when they start the film. 
um, which means you you cannot talk about it to anybody outside the four walls of the of the edit bay, you know, and that's so important. Um, and then when we take that very seriously, so that that gives you some some idea of the other things that I ask my assistants to do. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I think that's important for for people to hear. You know, upcoming film bankers, uh, just, you know, because those those are are traits that one could have, uh, but you can develop your yourself into having those traits. A lot of it is honestly about experience as well, and and mm. you'll learn this as you go. But there are certain things like a core passion and enthusiasm for movies is something you can't learn. You either have that or you don't have it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, earlier you mentioned a post-production supervisor. For those who may not know, could you describe their role? Yeah. A post-production supervisor is actually a critically important role, especially on a bigger budget movie, because their job is to schedule the post-production of the film and work out how many weeks of post-production you need to deliver a world-class product and be honest with the producers and the studio about if we're on schedule or not, if we have enough resources to finish the film, if things are going smoothly or not, and um, informing everybody of developments in post-production. You know, booking ADR, booking um, music studios, uh, for recording, booking sound studios, booking um, color correction facilities. Um, sometimes they will they will even negotiate the edit team's rates if they're on early enough. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll be in charge of the entire post production budget and um, feeding back to the studio on a weekly basis how everything's going, communicating with visual effects. But they they are effectively the um, the line producer of post-production, you know, it, it's, it, it's a very, um, it's a methodical logistical job, but it's also one which requires sensitivity and, uh, delicate politics to navigate all the different people that you communicate with on a daily basis to make sure that there's a, the movie is going to be finished because, Ultimately, their job is to make sure there is a movie to release by the release date on a big movie, on a big studio movie. If you so many millions of dollars is spent on marketing and, um, you know, product tie-ins and what, what have you, uh, and there are thousands of movie theaters around the world waiting for the film to arrive on schedule. And if it doesn't make it, it's a disaster. It's a massive embarrassment. Now, the studio will have several levels of checks to make sure that the movie's going to hit, you know, hit the release date. Um, but the post supervisor is the person who will be communicating on a weekly basis. This is how far through we are through the director's cut. This many... I mean, visual effects will also be communicating how many VFX shots have been turned over, but they will be aware of all that. And then how much, you know, how long the composer has been working for, how much ADR we've recorded, you know, how much work the sound team still has to do, how long the sound, the sound is going to take to mix, how long the foreign language versions are going to take to mix. Are we doing 3D? Are we doing an IMAX version? Are we doing... Um, there's this great new one called Screen X where they put stuff on the sides of the cinema, which takes time, takes weeks and weeks to take your movie and do the Screen X conversion. They do a brilliant job, by the way. Like I love the Screen X versions of Top Gun and of, of Mission. And, and we did one for Kingsman Golden Circle, which was very cool. So Screen X is really like a great value added proposition. Like I thought I saw the flash in Screen X and I thought they did an amazing job in that film as well. Um, so, but that's basically what a post supervisor does. You know, they, they're in charge of making sure that the film is finished on schedule and on budget, you know, in a way that a production manager or a line producer is during production. Having worked on both big budget and smaller budget films, could you describe the differences, if any, between the two? The difference between bigger budget and smaller budget moves, movies from an editor's perspective is really one of time and resources. And mm. visual effects. I think that's the thing. On a bigger budget movie, you will probably have more visual effects. And so mm. you have to lock in your edit decisions a lot earlier because you have to commit to certain shots being in the film. 
which is critically important when you're spending a lot of money on VFX shots. Um, and, and, a, and a constant communication with the visual effects department almost on a daily basis about how the edit is evolving and things that are changing. That's really important. So on a lower budget movie, you don't have that. On a bigger budget movie, you have more footage on a daily basis. Maybe you'll have a lot longer production. So you're, you're, in, you're kind of assembling the movie for a longer time. So on a lower budget movie, you might only be shooting for two weeks or three weeks, four weeks maybe. And so, you know, interestingly, on a film like Air, if you see that movie that came out last year, that, that, was, that was like a month of production. It was only four weeks or maybe five weeks of photography. And, um, and then they went, you know, the movie was edited like, you know, four or five weeks after that. So in, within like three months, they had done production and post-production and there was a finished movie. It was something like that, very, very quick. Not, not many visual effects really in that movie. It was period, but it was all a lot of hair and makeup and, and production design period. Amazing movie, by the way. If you haven't seen Air, take a look at it. It's great. But in terms of the core uh, principles of editing, which is basically visual storytelling, it's identical. How do I invest the audience in the protagonist? How do I tell the very best story? How do I manipulate the audience's emotions? And it is manipulation. Audiences are buying a ticket to be manipulated. It's not a, it's not a dirty word. You're choosing to go to a horror movie or a comedy or a rom-com or an action movie because you want to feel that emotion. And it's nice when you get surprised. You know, if you go to an action movie and it's also comedy or it's also got a bit of horror, then that's great. But, you're, you know, my job as the editor is to make sure that the audience is manipulated and how they want to be manipulated, how the storyteller wants to do it. And all you're thinking about when you're editing is – is the audience connected to the protagonist? Who am I in the protagonist's point of view visually? So, for example, making sure that you know the protagonist has more close-ups than other characters, supporting characters, so that you're more connected with that character. So, if you watch Top Gun Maverick, there's a pyramid, and it's Maverick at the top. There are more close-ups of him than anyone else. Then it's Rooster, um, and then maybe it's Penny maybe, or, or Phoenix or Hangman. And then under that, you've got like, you know, Phoenix and Bob and uh, Payback and Fanboy and Hangman, you know. So as you go down, you have fewer and fewer close-ups. So you're giving less prominence to those characters visually by your choice of shots in the edit, you know. So you're telling the audience who's important by how you're editing the film. When you choose to cut to someone's reaction, you know, how does that inform their character for the audience so that they understand the audience is connected with how that character feels about what's going on in the scene. If it's an action sequence, do I understand the stakes of the action? Do I care about the characters going in? What happens if they succeed? What happens if they fail? Um, what's the geography? Do I have a clear idea of the space that the characters are in if they're fighting? You know, I was watching Lord of the Rings over the holidays and all those battles are exquisite because you cut out to beautiful wide shots when you need to see how outnumbered the, the armies are. You know, the, there's, there's 10,000 orcs and there's only a thousand riders of Rohirrim, you know, and you get these extraordinary wide shots where you can see the geography clearly and you understand, you know, what the heroes are up against and what their objectives are. You know, you see Frodo and Sam climbing up Mount Doom and you know they have to get up to drop the ring in the top so you can see the geography is clear about what their objective is and how far they have to go. And where is the eye of Sauron looking at any one time? You know, all, the, all that kind of stuff is so important um, when you're editing to make sure the audience understands it. It's all considered. You know, like I said, no detail is too insignificant. So... The, the job of editing is the same in terms of pure visual storytelling. Now, could you explain what an edit decision list is and how it's used? Okay. So an edit decision list is a uh, human readable document, which is also machine readable in terms of um, telling a computer what footage is on your timeline so that 
you can take the offline edit that you've done with your low resolution footage and mm -hmm. you can basically tell a computer to rebuild your film using the um, uncompressed camera master original footage. So it will say from this point to this point on the timeline, I've used this point to this point of the source material. So if you look at an edit decision list, it's a lot of time codes basically and roll camera roll numbers. And it's saying from this camera roll, use this little piece of footage and stick it here in the timeline. Um, and it could be a file which is not human readable, like an XML or something, but a, but an old school EDL, an edit decision list, is a text file that humans can read as well if they need to. Um, so it's that in a nutshell. It's just telling a computer what shots are in your movie. And as far as working with sound, during that post-production process, are you working in parallel with them, in conjunction with them? Does your work directly affect what they're doing and vice versa? Yeah, it's a very two-way process. So sound mm -hmm. is incredibly important because it's half the storytelling. You know, it's 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 half the the power that you have as a storyteller to manipulate the audience. Sound and music, obviously, and then visuals. Mm -hmm. If you look at a film like Jaws, if if you didn't have the sound or the music, the movie would be engaging but it would not have the same emotional effect you know that's one of my all-time favorite movies edited by Werner Fields and Steven Spielberg himself says that you know John Williams score is at least half the emotional impact of that movie which I I agree with the score is sublime the editing is amazing as well I having done some complex action sequences with a lot of raw footage I can imagine Werner Fields looking at hours and hours of the orca on the sea and going, how am I ever going to make something out of this? And then slowly figuring out the, the different beats of the action when the heroes are fighting the shark in the second half of that movie. But, but it's incredibly difficult what she did so brilliantly. First of all, I take a lot of time working with dialogue and making sure that I have the cleanest dialogue that I can possibly have for every line in the movie. And then I'll start building up a temp soundtrack on my timeline. Um, I will say for a big action movie, average sound is worse than no sound. So quite often when I'm working on an action sequence with Christopher McQuarrie, for example, we will work totally silent and we'll just imagine all the sound and the music and we'll just watch the images for pure visual storytelling and rhythm internal rhythm and pace um, and comprehension in terms of, you know, do I understand what's going on? Um, and then we'll imagine the sound and then the sound team, who is quite a few people, uh, will work on delivering sound effects to us that are really world-class level movie sound effects, which we can do in the Media Composer, but it's always a little bit rough and ready. And if you have professionals doing it, you will get something which sounds more like a movie. And therefore, when you're screening the film, even straight off the Avid timeline, uh, it will sound more like a film and the producers and everyone will relax more about the fact that this is going to be great when it's finished. Um, but I work very closely with the sound team um, almost usually from about halfway through production when we've start to got stuck, when we've start to have sequences assembled, we'll send them to the sound team and they'll start working on them so that they can get ahead. Certainly on more complicate, complex sequences, like the helicopter sequence at the end of Mission Impossible Fallout was very, very challenging sound-wise because a helicopter is, is quite a, a kind of rhythmic noise that can get repetitive and slightly dull quite quickly. So to keep it varied is a, a real challenge and they guys did an amazing job if you watch that movie and listen to the helicopter sound design, it's phenomenal what they did. It's always alive and crackling. Power. The same with car chases and, you know, all that stuff, the way that you can have the sounds of brakes and, and tires and, 
and you know gear changes and all that just to give the the scenes life and crunch and excitement and percussion you know um so we work very closely with the sound and then i'm obviously i'm i'm on the sound mixing stage with the director and and we're giving feedback to the sound mixers over the weeks that it takes to mix the sound for the film as well you know and and on these movies on a film like top gun or mission impossible tom cruise is there as well with us monitoring, you know, he'll come in once or twice a week and listen to what we're doing and give us notes. And he just wants sonic perfection from the very beginning of the movie to the very end of the movie. And I I swear, if you listen to the sound on Top Gun Maverick or on Mission Impossible, uh, you know, Dead Reckoning or Fallout or any of those, you are listening to the very best possible sound mix that technology can deliver at that time you know there is no substitute for just world-class perfection on the sound on those movies and the color and everything but the sound is really really phenomenal on those films and and Mm -hmm. i know that we all take it a bit for granted because we all watch a lot of stuff all the time and the sound is very good on everything that we watch but you know the there's a reason they won the academy award for top gun maverick if you know Mm -hmm. what i'm saying you know definitely definitely now, as far as creative problem solving, I'm sure you know and have probably experienced not everything goes to plan. Could you share any experiences you've had on your previous projects where maybe a scene just wasn't working for whatever reason? So creative problem solving with editing is usually needed because a storytelling problem Uh, was not identified at the script stage or during production. And so it has come to bite us in the ass in editorial. Or it was ignored deliberately because they couldn't figure it out at script stage or in production. And so it's been punted to editorial. But when we're building the film and we're finishing the movie, we have to fix all the problems. And so um, editing is one of the ways that you can creatively solve problems. And as I said, for example, in that scene in Top Gun Maverick with Maverick and Penny hugging on the beach, there used to be dialogue there and the scene worked better without dialogue. In this, And then just after that, there is a mission briefing where you see um, Cyclone and Warlock talking about what the uh, daggers, the, the F-18s, have to do in enemy territory. It's a kind of reminder for the audience of everything that they've learned during the training in the previous hour of the movie. But it's all kind of packaged succinctly as a little reminder before the jets take off. And we didn't really have enough footage to fill that scene. And so um, Stephen Mirioni, who was another editor who came on to help me when I was overwhelmed with aerial footage, he came up with a way of intercutting that mission briefing with shots of Maverick and the other pilots on the deck inspecting their planes and suiting up and kind of getting into the cockpits. And that was a brilliant way of intercutting those scenes and those images and finding a great piece of music to run under that, to create a uh, a kind of visual tone poem for that moment in the movie before we get into the mission it's it's a very kind of introspective nervous um anxious part of the process where the pilots are like worried about whether they're going to come back alive or not to be honest and maverick caring for them all and especially for rooster and the fact that you know he doesn't think he's going to come back because you know there's that moment where he says to hondo you know um or Hondo says to him, it's been, it's, been a, it's been an honor, sir. You know, and you feel this understanding between the two of them that Maverick may not come back from this mission. And he'll certainly give his life to save Rooster. And so that emotion was uh, very, very succinctly communicated um, by intercutting those images with the mission briefing. Um, so those are some potential ways you know you you can re- sometimes if a character isn't working you can remove an entire character from a movie uh there are you can google many stories about films that have had whole characters removed because the characters were didn't work very well or were unnecessary um films can be totally have you had any of those experiences where you've had to make a make a major make, change make a whole character well well um 
so for example or, this, or any aspect of the film that just wasn't yeah, working yeah no no it. i will tell you so something about mission impossible dead reckoning initially at the end of the second act um it's a bit of a spoiler probably for, for those of you who may not have seen it but ethan and the team they recruit grace to join them mm-hmm. um and it's it's a little bit of a of a of a reflection of what might have happened when Ethan or Benji or Luther was recruited into the IMF. You know, they're offered the choice, and they're off, they offer Grace the choice to join them, and she has to choose to accept or not. And in the film now, she chooses to go on the mission with them, but the mask machine breaks, so she has to go on the train on her own. Ethan can't go in to help her. Um. Uh, because there's no time. But in the original version, she used the tranquilizer gun to dart, to tranquilize the team. And she went on the mission on her own. So she chose to, she chose herself over the team to go onto the train to get the keys to kind of negotiate her own freedom. Okay. And the audience rejected that. They said, we don't like her. Because she keeps outsmarting the team and we're not with her in this third act. Uh, And so we went back and we reshot the scene where the mask machine was broken so that it was clear that Grace had chosen to be with the team and not fight against them. So you're actually, but then she's forced to go on alone because the mask machine breaks. So now you're, you're, you're with her even more because she's bravely decided to go on and do this for the greater good to get the key to, you know, to defeat the, the entity, the AI. Um, and then when we did that, and it was a few hours of additional photography. Um, and when we showed the audience that then they were totally with her. Um, and it made a whole difference to the, the emotional investment for the last hour of the movie. Uh, so it was a very simple fix. Um, although we did spend a lot of time thinking about what the correct fix would be, but that, that is an example of, of where something's not working and you, you kind of use a different solution to make it work. Um, um, and, and, you know, if, if, if your movie is too long, you have to cut it down uh, until the audience tells you that it's the right length. And, and, you know, that's pure editing is about, is about reducing uh, the runtime, but maintaining the coherence of the story and the emotion of the story so that you still care about everybody. If you compress a film too much, it becomes information only and therefore not emotional, you know, and information is the death of emotion. And so it's very important then if you find yourself in the position where you've over tightened your movie and every filmmaker should get to that point, like you should try it so that you break it. And then you know you've gone too far, and then you can start putting back in dramatic air um, and and allowing emotions to to play out a tiny bit longer so that you give the audience time to connect to the characters in each moment rather than rushing through it and just have and not feeling anything you know mm. um, that's the kind of very delicate balance that you do when you're editing the whole time um, and quite you know sometimes you might take a series of scenes and use a montage, you know, it's, you were all thinking of team America now, aren't we? But the, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, literally if you've got several scenes that are kind of outstaying their welcome and you can play some music and compress them down to like one or two key lines of dialogue or tiny beats of action, you can tell the same story with a montage. And there's a reason why these montages work so well is because there's a lot of story in a short amount of time, you know, which is, which is the Holy grail with, with filmmaking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Eddie, thank you so much for your time. You've given us such invaluable information Um, to wrap up. Do you have any parting words of advice, encouragement, tips, or, uh, you know, common mistakes that you see editors make and for somebody that's looking to become an editor? So I, the most important thing, the most important piece of advice I can give you is edit as much as you can and, and practice. There's a theory that anything that to get good at anything takes 10,000 hours 
um, which I agree with. If I give you a violin, uh, you will not be able to play it in the first hour. But if you've practiced for 10,000 hours, you'll probably be pretty good at the violin. If you want to be good at editing, you won't be good in the first hour or the first day or, or not even the first few months or even a year. Um, so 10,000 hours can be split down like this. If you work for 250 days a year, which is roughly Monday to Friday, and you work for 10 hours a day, Monday to Friday, that's two and a half thousand hours. And so 10,000 hours is four years working Monday to Friday for 10 hours a day. That is the kind of length of time that you have to imagine you're going to commit to being excellent at anything in your life, but especially editing. And I'm still learning stuff. I've been doing this for over 30 years and I still learn all the time. I teach myself, I watch other movies uh, and, and I learn how other editors work or, or I see how, how my emotions are stirred by watching certain editorial choices from other people. Um, we all have a camera in our pocket on our phone and you can edit on your phone. So really the resources are there. You know, you can download Avid Media Composer for free um, if you're a student or there's a totally free version if you're not a student, but you can download the full version for free if you're, if you're you know, in education and start practicing on it. Um, DaVinci Resolve is completely free, you know, up to 1080. Um, so, so if you sit with your friends – and you, you write a one-page script during the week and uh, you prep it on a Friday and you shoot it on a Saturday and you edit it on a Sunday and put it on YouTube on Sunday night, you'll learn so much by doing that. And you'll get people can watch it and give you feedback straight away. And, and you, you will discover that your early movies are, are really very average um, and you'll make tons and tons of mistakes. But that's because you're a beginner and you're learning how to do it and you will get better. So just keep doing it. Um, maintain your enthusiasm and your passion um, and never stop smiling. You know, and you, if you, if you focus on your goals, you will succeed. Absolutely. Well, thank you for those words. Thank you for your information and thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Brandon. Thank you, everybody. Good luck out there in movie land. If you're looking for more interviews or deep dives into the Studio Binder software, be sure to like and subscribe to be notified when new videos are added. I'm Brandon with Studio Binder Academy. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.